Thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you. Um, I want to uh, go back to uh, when we started OpenCourseWare at MIT. I want to do that because the experience from that I think will be uh, very helpful and it will inform, or could inform, the conversation that's going on today uh, in open education, including MOOCs. Okay. Um, so back in year 2000, I mean, most of you know uh, much of this, but I want to go over it very quickly uh, and then bring it to today. So back in 2000, then president of uh, MIT, Chuck Vest, uh, brought together a small number of faculty members and some administrators uh, to come up with the e-learning strategy for MIT. This was year 2000. Uh, it was a uh, uh, dot-com era. The, uh, the, burst, uh, the bubble had not burst. And so the assumption was that we would come up with uh, MIT dot com and we would come up with a business model, a hockey stick that would get us lots of money. Okay? Um, and we worked uh, very closely with Booz Allen Hamilton, the consulting firm, to come up with a number of business models and we we're going to pick the best one, uh, hopefully the hockey stick. But uh, as uh, we uh, looked at the, the possible numbers for cost and revenue, the best uh, business model that we could come up with was this, uh, a reven revenue neutral um, business model. And we thought, you know, this would not be bad, but this is the dot-com era where we're reading about uh, institutions and companies making millions and millions of dollars. And we thought, and already there are so many institutions in the space, why should MIT be the, the 20th institution uh, going in and basically with a business model that's not going to make a big splash? Okay. So that sort of uh, gave us a pause uh, with regard to MIT.com. But there was a second and even more important um, uh, pause, uh, and this is uh, particularly important for today. So there were about 60 faculty members, MIT faculty members, who had already put uh, their teaching materials on the web back in the year 2000. And so we went around and asked them, why are you doing that? Because we needed to understand the motivation behind uh, their desire to, uh, to open, the, open up their classrooms. And without exception, and we interviewed every one of them, they all said that I'm just trying to improve my class. Okay? And they were uh, experimenting with uh, this new uh, web uh, to see if they could uh, uh, improve their uh, teaching and learning. Okay? And so that really uh, clinched the point that we really shouldn't do MIT.com. Okay? It's not right to take uh, these educational materials uh, created by these professors who are so committed to education and turn it into money. Okay? And so instead, we said, look, let's, let's uh, do something completely different. Let's turn it on its head and let's give it away. Okay? Let's give it away because in this way, the, uh, the educational materials that uh, are produced by our faculty members can benefit the whole world. Okay? And let's uh, do it wide open, free, uh, and without any need to register. Okay? And so that's what we did. We proposed open courseware and we proposed it to then President Chuck Vest, uh, who loved the idea. Uh, and uh, he ran with it. And in fact, he gave us the quote that, in my heart, really captures open education even today. He said, look, the reason why we're doing it is that if you share money, it disappears, but if you share knowledge, it increases. Okay? And that's really at the heart of open education. No matter what you do, uh, we are sharing knowledge, and when you do that, it increases, unlike money. Okay? Uh, Something else that was important uh, was that this idea of sharing freely with the world our educational material was aligned with our institutional mission, the MIT mission. Uh, and the MIT mission, uh, this is right off the web, sa says the institute is committed to generating, disseminating, and preserving knowledge and to working with others to bring this knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. Uh, before OpenCourseWare, this mission was fulfilled primarily by basic research. But with OpenCourseWare, and now with, uh, with MOOCs, uh, we are able to fulfill this uh, from an educational standpoint. Okay? So it's fully aligned with institutional mission. Okay? Uh, and so we started OpenCourseWare in 2001. Uh, and uh, today, we, uh, there are 1.5 million people 
each month that access open courseware. Since the inception, uh, 175 million people have accessed open courseware, and the number keeps going up. You know, as the, the MOOC world uh, expands, so has open courseware. Ten years later, uh, we get the MOOC uh, world starting. Yeah, it's a very, very exciting trend uh, that has started, again, in this same space of open education. <clears throat> um, I was very excited about uh, uh, the, the MOOC uh, approach, and uh, I myself did a MOOC. Uh, it was a uh, MIT-Harvard joint MOOC, I, maybe one of the f only few MOOCs that uh, is jointly produced by two institutions. Um, and I was particularly inter interested in uh, uh, the idea of collaboration. Okay, so right away we get Harvard and MIT, and uh, uh, so scholars from Harvard, MIT, and we got a colleague from Duke to uh, pitch in um, to teach this one MOOC. Okay. Uh, we got uh, uh, Harvard X and MIT X people working together, uh, and that was very interesting. You know, you know, Harvard and MIT are two subways and sort of light years away in the approach to a lot of things, and so it was a challenge uh, in, in the beginning, but it was it was it was great. Uh, once we got started. Uh, University of Tokyo came in and they produced two companion MOOCs uh, to our Visualizing Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, starting next month, uh, the Visualizing Japan MOOC, uh, MIT Harvard MOOC, and the two University of Tokyo MOOCs will be offered as an X series uh, in uh, uh, edX. Uh, so uh, one of the things that really intrigued me about MOOCs is the, the social aspect of it. And uh, uh, I got to see right away what it was going to be like. Uh, uh, so uh, in the beginning, on the first day, we threw up this image. This is a Shiseido image from the 1930s. And we uh, asked the, uh, the discussion forum to just discuss this. Uh, what do you see about this? What do you see about modernity uh, and cosmopolitanism? And uh, 804 people uh, posted very thoughtful uh, and often long paragraphs. Uh, and that really surprised me. Uh, and this active discussion continued until the end of the course. Uh, 3,000 started the course. There were 10,000 who were registered for the course, but the first day we had 3,000 show up, and 1,172 actually completed the course. So that's a pretty high uh, completion rate. One of the, uh, I also taught a uh, residential class uh, simultaneous with uh, the MOOC. Uh, it was the, the first time I offered the course. I only had nine students to begin with. So I had nine students here and 3,000 students uh, uh, in the MOOC world, literally going, uh, uh, simultaneously, and uh, that was very exciting. One of the students in uh, my residential uh, class uh, did a little bit of research into the MOOCs, and one of the things that we were interested in was persistence. And uh, what he found, something that uh, Mike uh, from uh, Open University also mentioned, is that the number of postings correlated with persistence. So in the beginning, uh, on the third day, uh, among the active uh, uh, participants, the average posting was 2.68 postings per active participant. participant. Midway, 7.73, and near the end, uh, 10 postings uh, per active uh, learner. So this uh, sort of showed us, uh, you know, this is certainly not the only uh, factor for persistence, but uh, it really showed us that uh, if we can do uh, even a better job at getting people to participate in the forums, uh, we could have a better persistence than we have today. So, um, so that that was something that really uh, was interesting. Uh, the other thing that was interesting are the learners that came in. We had uh, something like 140 countries represented, uh, and one of them is uh, this young man Ahan, who. Uh, uh, introduce himself as uh, uh, someone who is being homeschooled, and this is his 16th MOOC. Uh, he had taken 15 uh, edX STEM MOOCs, and then he came into this as a, a, the first humanities MOOC. He became so active in the forum that uh, we appointed him as a uh, community TA. 
And what he told me is, and I had him over to my residential class, what he said is, uh, uh, MOOCs have given me almost all of my high school education. He was being homeschooled. He's 15 years old, and he's, uh, he was recently accepted into MIT as class of 2019. So this is a so new new wave. MOOCs uh, have educated this young man who is now at MIT. Okay, we're going to see more and more of this. Okay. Um, so this was really exciting, uh, and we were serving a, a, uh, um, a group of people, two, three thousand people outside of MIT. But then I started to think about this, you know, well, what, what are we doing here? And I, I come back to what those 60 faculty members told me back in year 2000. I'm just trying to improve my class. Okay. Uh, and more and more, I think that uh, it's, it's very important to do the MOOCs as we have done, but ultimately we have to bring it back to our res residential education. Okay. This is critical if this, uh, this movement is to succeed. Uh, and, and in fact, at MIT, you can see very uh, concretely that this is an effort that uh, uh, is uh, uh, very important to us. And you can see it from uh, back in year 2000. Uh, so at MIT, uh, using the residential MIT X platform, the open edX platform, custom, customized to the MIT campus, there are 120 classes that use the uh, MIT X platform. And many of these are general institute requirement courses. These are courses that all students must take. And as a result, 83% of undergraduates have taken a class that used the uh, residential MIT X platform in a substantial way. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is so important to me, uh, remembering that you know, I'm just trying to improve my, my class education. Hmm? Biology, for example, has uh, 10 classes, including their GIR, uh, uh, Introduction to Biology, using uh, MITx platform. Okay. Physics, for example, Physics 802, uh, taken by all MIT students, uh, and uh, each semester or each year, they uh, it's taken by 800 freshmen. Uh, MIT X platform uh, is used to provide automated feedback to activities done outside of class. Okay. Uh, so part of the homework, not all of the homework, part of the homework has been put on MIT X, and uh, it gives automatic feedback on the initial try. You, you do it once, if you get it right, you get green. If you don't get it right, you get red, and you can have multiple tries. And uh, this en enables the students to know when they made a mistake before submitting the homework, uh, and uh, reduce stress, and uh, raise self-confidence. And this is what uh, my physics colleagues are telling me. And the students really liked it. it was, uh, they gave it a 95% uh, approval rating. That's, uh, 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 this is, uh, according to them, a higher approval rating than pizza. Okay? So this is the, the height of open education. We've, we've uh, overcome pizza. Okay. <laughs> uh, in my class, in my residential uh, MIT class, Visualizing Japan, uh, I started to use the MOOC material, the video lectures, as uh, as reading assignment, except that they are video lectures. And uh, uh, I noticed right away that students were somehow different. Uh, they actually came into class having viewed the videos, and they had retained a lot of the knowledge. So that um, in a traditional lecture class, I would speak about 80% of the time and 20% uh, students, but uh, in um, in the flip class, uh, it was 50-50. Again, a student taking my residential class actually timed me. Okay? Uh, and so this is very scientific. Okay? Uh, and this was, uh, this was uh, very exciting. Uh, John Belcher, one of my heroes, he's a physics professor at MIT who has been experimenting with uh, new ways of teaching physics, uh, told me that blended or flipped education is the wave of the future. Okay? We heard this uh, this morning in the panel as well. Okay? I am completely convinced. Okay? Um, MIT liked what was going on, and uh, they put a very nice uh, MIT news uh, piece about the class. Okay, okay. so uh, lessons uh, learned. Um, 
improve residential education. I think that's critical if we are to uh, sustain what we are doing. It's great to serve uh, the global classroom, but ultimately we have to bring it back to residential education. Okay? Uh, aligned with institutional mission. Uh, Marie yesterday from Maryland uh, talked this. There are so many opportunities that come our way, but we have to really, really focus on what our educational mission is. Okay? And so to the extent possible, anything that we do in open education should have these two components. Okay? I mean, there are times that you can transcend these. Okay? If you, for example, do a MOOC on uh, uh, Syrian refugee camps and teach the world about Syrian refugee camps, okay, you get a pass on these because that would serve uh, such an important role in uh, what's going on today. Okay? But uh, for the rest of uh, open education, I think it's critical, based on our experience with open courseware, that to sustain this, uh, these two must be, um, or at least one of them, uh, must be uh, uh, a priority. Okay? Uh, and I guess the final thing is, uh, uh, looking back on it, uh, we couldn't do the hockey stick. We could only do revenue neutral, and we decided not to pursue uh, this, but today, revenue, revenue neutral it seems very attractive, okay? <laughs> very attractive. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Anand talked about how important sustainability is. We aren't there yet, okay? And I can tell you about how you align yourself with your uh, institutional mission. I can tell you about uh, how you can have an impact on residential education, okay? This one, I don't know. Okay, it's, this is beyond my capability. In fact, I told Peter Kaufman that uh, I'm going to end uh, the talk with, you know, I don't know how to solve this. And Peter had an idea. He said, I, I know what to do. He said, we just take the L from the name of this uh, conference. You can see here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we solve the problem. <laughs> Thank you.